Good morning, everyone. It's been quite a week, huh? What's today, Wednesday? Friday? The next week? Three weeks? In any event, I want to thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, I want to welcome you, of course, to this legislative uh, briefing. Um, obviously, the uh, tragic events of the, of the uh, week of Monday, in particular at the Navy Yard, uh, continue to be uh, foremost in the minds of virtually everybody. And of course, I want to uh, once again extend my uh, condolences, my sympathies to the families uh, whose family members were uh, unfortunately affected uh, by this. I took the opportunity yesterday, uh, as time permitted, to try to call every one of the families, and uh, I was able to get 10 of the 12 uh, and talk to them. And I'm glad I did that. So, as you might imagine, it's a very difficult experience, you know, talking to people who have just had uh, such a tragic set of events uh, in their lives. Uh, and we may do more, uh, we'll see uh, at this stage, but I'm really glad I took the opportunity to talk with them. And if we can find the phone numbers of the other two relatives who were identified, uh, I'll do that uh, as well. Um, the, uh, let me remind you that the, the, the shootings uh, have transitioned now uh, from the local authorities, MPD and FMES and others here at the local level, over to the FBI uh, and uh, federal agencies. They've taken over, and you've seen more of them uh, the last 24 hours or, or so uh, on the, uh, the set of uh, incidents that occurred. Um, we certainly have no intention of usurping uh, their role. Uh, that, that hopefully is obvious. Um, so I'm inclined to address, uh, if there are questions, we'll try to address those questions, but I don't want that to be the dominating theme uh, of this uh, press briefing uh, this morning. I do want to take the opportunity again to express my gratitude to our first responders uh, here in the District of Columbia, uh, to uh, the MPD, uh, to uh, FMES, to our Homeland Security, uh, agency, uh, all, of, uh, all of whom, the first responders, did, I think, a phenomenal job. Uh, they were on the scene within a matter of minutes, uh, single-digit uh, minutes, and did just an incredible job addressing perhaps one of the most horrific events uh, in the history uh, of the city, certain, uh, certainly of, the, of, this, uh, of this kind. Um, I want to also indicate um, that how proud we are of Officer Scott Williams, uh, who was right in the line of fire. Uh, he was shot. Um, he was actually taken out to the gate uh, and then trans transported uh, to the uh, hospital, the Washington Hospital Center, uh, by uh, FMES uh, to get him there. And I did see him. Uh, we were at the hospital on uh, Monday night. Uh, he already had undergone surgery. And I really could not believe the spirits uh, this man was in. It, you, you would have thought that he was there on a holiday uh, or something. Uh, his family had come down from Pennsylvania uh, to be with him. Uh, and there were many, many officers uh, who were there uh, as well. So once again, uh, someone uh, of whom we should be uh, very, very uh, proud. Uh, in any event, this morning, I want to focus on my uh, legislative pro priorities, uh, as we've been uh, planning to do uh, even before the events of uh, Monday uh, occurred. Um, I think we now have the debate, the difficult debate, of the Large Retailer Accountability Act. Uh, there are probably people who will never forget those words uh, ever uh, in life. The uh, override uh, was overridden. <laughs> Uh, yesterday uh, by the uh, council in a seven to six vote. And um, now I just hope we'll move on, uh, move on and hopefully continue to build on what I think is the very considerable uh, common ground uh, between uh, my colleagues on the council uh, and me. And I think even though people tend to focus on where their differences, I think for those who choose to look at where we, there is agreement, 
you'll find more agreement on issues than you'll find disagreement. And that's what we want to continue to build on. Um, again, I want to thank all the council members who uh, voted to uh, sustain uh, my veto. And uh, for those seven who didn't, uh, I'm sure they had good reasons. Uh, and uh, now hopefully all 13 will come together with us to move on uh, from, uh, from that. I think most of you know, <coughs> uh, excuse me, that I thought uh, the LRAA was a flawed bill uh, that actually would have a material negative impact on job creation uh, as well as the economic development agenda uh, here that we've been pursuing in the District of Columbia. And now we have to um, focus our efforts to help all of our D.C. residents. And uh, you heard some bills introduced yesterday around minimum wage. Uh, I've talked about that. That will be one of our legislative priorities. And I've talked a little bit about the process, and I'll talk about it again today, of how we may uh, do that. Um, I think lots of people believe that we should raise uh, the minimum wage, not for a few, but for a lot uh, at this stage, and that's what we will be focusing on. Um, an increase in the minimum wage, I think, as we all know, helps all workers, uh, and that's, frankly, the right thing to do uh, from my perspective, um, and that's what we will pursue. Uh, again, the Council obviously already is engaging uh, <coughs> in some of those discussions and we'll be, um, you know, we'll be pursuing bills. I suspect this is one of those issues that by the time it's all said and done, we'll have numerous bills. Uh, <laughs> isn't it amazing how people, you know, of one accord, you know, on an issue? It may not be an issue today, but if you wait until next week, uh, lots of people will find it uh, to be an issue. Uh, in any event, I think there were two or three bills that were introduced uh, yesterday. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the hearings uh, on those bills as we move forward. Let me turn now to tax lien uh, sales. Uh, last week, um, along with Dr. Gandhi, our chief financial officer, uh, we ordered the uh, cancellation of the 2013 tax lien sales uh, for all property owners uh, receiving the homestead deduction where foreclosure proceedings have not yet uh, begun. Those would be tax sales that actually took place in July. So we're about halfway through the period uh, before we would move to the next phase. We've gone through about three months now. Uh, there's a six-month period uh, in which uh, we, would, we would get through that before any foreclosure proceedings uh, would begin. Um, the cancellation order means that the district will step in uh, and redeem the properties from the uh, tax sale purchasers. Uh, I think we started with a list of 144. Uh, two were redeemed before we got to this stage, which brought it down to 142. Uh, I don't know that the exact number, uh, the, the number that was required to redeem all these properties, but frankly, when you look at the consequences, it's a very small price to pay to be able to try to ensure that people uh, do uh, remain uh, in their homes. Um, we will, uh, we will, uh, also, uh, in the course of moving with this uh, action, uh, we will be uh, appointing a, uh, an ombudsman uh, who will be available to work with people uh, who may be uh, at the threshold of ex having an experience of um, about to lose their home. And we hope that this person can help them navigate through what sometimes can be a Byzantine uh, complicated and not very friendly uh, <coughs> process. Um, speaking of CFO, uh, we know that the next chief uh, financial officer will have a uh, major role uh, in moving quickly to deal with the tax lien sale problems as uh, well as many others. And um, we will uh, hopefully very soon begin, I will transmit a name very soon. Uh, and you're probably sitting there, Tom Sherwood, saying, how soon is very soon? <laughs> yeah, it, it very soon means it will be um, within a matter of weeks or months. <laughs> <laughs> She's the educator. <laughs> you're the prognosticator, though. I thought you would have known that. <laughs> What's the two? Veto, I said July 10th. 
four months before you file it. Mm. What's your next prognostication? <laughs> <laughs> Will it be soon or very soon? Very soon next week for months. <laughs> I want to thank you for leading us, uh, you know, on a path of uh, foretelling the future for us. Uh, anyway, uh, we will be uh, transmitting the name of a proposed new CFO very soon. And uh, we hope that the council will move quickly in order to uh, address that. Um, a part of the thank you, a part of the um, legislative agenda uh, as well uh, will be campaign finance reform. Uh, we we actually uh, crafted bills uh, bill uh, a while ago, a number of months ago, and uh, there are lingering issues around campaign <coughs> finance reform. Uh, this legislation, we think, which has actually been lauded by some. Uh, will bring um, additional accountability and transparency uh, to our campaign uh, finance uh, system. Uh, and we think it will make uh, a mighty contribution to us being able to not only be transparent but accountable for how dollars are raised and dollars are spent around campaigns, uh, campaigns in the city. The proposed pay-to-play provisions of the legislation would bar those uh, who uh, have or are seeking uh, contracts or grants with the district valued at $250,000 uh, or higher from contributing to any elected official uh, or candidate who would be involved in the approval process for the contract uh, or grant. Uh, the bill would also prohibit lobbyists uh, from bundling. Everybody knows what bundling contributions is, right? Uh, that would be putting them together, either soon or very soon. Uh, money orders would be subject to the same limitations as cash contributions, and candidates would be more accountable uh, for what their politi political uh, committees uh, actually do. Uh, violators of the law would uh, be subject to civil penalties and criminal prosecution up to five years in prison and a maximum fine of $10,000. Um, another part of the um, agenda for the fall uh, will be continuing on with the uh, undergrounding uh, commitment uh, that we made. Um, we know that there have been power outages that have been absolutely maddening uh, for lots of people uh, here in the city. Uh, there have been some recently, but not nearly of the uh, enormity uh, of, of a, a year, year and a half ago. Um, the legislation that has been put together, and I think this, this is one of those where the process may be almost as important as the outcome. Uh, I want to again commend Alan, uh, Alan Lewis, City Administrator, for helping to lead a process that brought together PEPCO, uh, that brought together the People's Council, brought together the Public Service Commission, <clears throat> and advocates uh, on this issue in the community. I think there were people who were very skeptical about the likelihood of the success of this approach uh, at the beginning. But at the end of the day, we were able to um, work with everybody and reach what we think is a harmonious, um, effective uh, solution uh, on this issue. What the legislation will do uh, is to authorize the issuance of revenue bonds and provide funding uh, from the bond proceeds to the district's uh, Department of uh, Transportation to finance construction uh, of underground equipment and facilities for electric uh, distribution. Uh, together with associated uh, roadway uh, restoration that would be associated with this uh, effort. Uh, the legislation would authorize <coughs> the imposition of a special funding surcharge that uh, the electric company, i.e. PEPCO, uh, can recover from certain customers to pay for uh, undergrounding. Uh, there will be legislation around a soccer stadium also. Uh, you all knew we were planning to build a soccer stadium, didn't you? If you didn't know that, please raise your hand and tell us where you've been for the last three months. Uh, to um, make way for the new soccer stadium at Buzzer Point, um, we announced a proposal with DC United and landowners to execute a land swap uh, involving properties uh, at the Buzzer Point uh, as well as at the Reeves Center at 14th and U Street, U Street's uh, northwest. Uh, the uh, land swap is a mechanism uh, that the city has successfully used in the past to acquire uh, strategic parcels of land in a timely manner. 
Uh, it was used for the Convention Center Hotel, and I guess it was used, at least some, some uh, associated process was used for the ballpark, right, now the National Stadium, uh, which has turned out to be um, quite a success. Anybody following the team these days? They're really playing well, aren't they? Doubleheader yesterday. I think we've won, I don't know, I think we're like 27 and 10 over the last uh, month and a half. Could still make the playoffs, guys. I think we're, I don't know, four or five games out of the playoff spot. How many? Four and a half. Four and a half. That's not bad. Nobody would have given us a chance to even still be in contention uh, at this stage. So keep hope alive. <laughs> um, in any event, uh, I am asking the council to approve a number of the elements of the agreement. Uh, that would be the swaps, the leases, tax relief, and uh, sale uh, of the district property. Um, we announced uh, last week a project labor uh, agreement that will help to put people to work uh, with a, a good deal of certainty. And for those who have questions about whether work will be available for uh, CBEs, it will, right, Alan? And the, we have the convention center. We have also the uh, National Stadium as uh, examples of that. Uh, do you remember what the CBE participation level was in National Stadium? 52%. Uh, which is above any uh, legislative, uh, any statutory requirements that would be imposed upon us, and we'll be uh, working to achieve the same thing uh, in this instance. Again, there'll be hundreds of jobs <coughs> that will be created for district residents um, and tens of millions of dollars in economic activity uh, and new revenue. And we think we'll really have a catalytic effect on Buzzard Point. I mean, if you've been over there, you know the condition of that area is on the opposite side of South, Ca South Capitol Street from where the stadium is uh, off of Potomac Avenue. And it really will have a catalytic effect uh, on that area, we think, anyway, just as the stadium has. Um, next is the Sustainable D.C. Uh, Act of 2013. Last year, I introduced the Sustainable D.C. Act uh, to begin a down payment toward making the district the healthiest, greenest, and most livable city uh, in the United States. Uh, now, the counterpart bill will be introduced, uh, and that is the Sustainable D.C. Act of 2013. Uh, this will advance our goals even further, and I still think we have the most aggressive, um, forward-thinking sustainability plan uh, in the nation. It is a plan that will take us, takes us to, uh, through 2032 with 143 initiatives associated with it, and we will continue to build on those now. Um, I think we've made progress already on about a third uh, of those initiatives, e even though we're just really early into the process. And uh, obviously, we'll be moving aggressively forward with the leadership of DDOE uh, in that regard. Um, I will uh, also introduce a complementary set of uh, mayor's orders uh, to generate a series of plans and reports that will guide implementation of the greening of the District of Columbia over these next two decades by 2032. Um, one piece of legislation also will focus on a ban on coal. We've had much debate, uh, the burning of coal, much debate on that uh, in the city. We've worked very closely with the advocates, some of whom worked very closely with us on the sustainability plan, so it was a fairly harmonious environment um, that uh, we were able to work within uh, around the ban on coal. Um, the bill, bill that I will introduce uh, will ban coal burning uh, in the District of Columbia. The ban will take effect 18 months after the construction of the Capital Power uh, plant's uh, cogeneration uh, plant, the cogen plant that is, is planned uh, for that area. And obviously, this involves the federal government because this is, uh, you know, involving the capital. So we're working closely with the uh, federal sector to be able to make this uh, happen. Uh, my proposal includes emissions limits for burning coal uh, for the purposes of um, tuning and testing as required uh, by the Federal uh, Clean Air Act and by uh, district regulations. Um, some of you will recall that we've had vigorous discussion around certified business enterprise reform. Uh, I feel like we've been with this one for about a year uh, at this stage. Some will recall we had a piece of legislation on the table. There were changes that were made by the council, changes that I thought we couldn't uh, live with. And so uh, that bill was vetoed. And um, that bill was, was not overridden uh, either. 
Uh, we're now back. We look forward to working with the members who are most involved with this to be able to uh, move this piece of legislation uh, forward without a lot of uh, impediments. Uh, and we, we are working closely with uh, the uh, council uh, on this. Um, we've already invested more resources, some of you may know that, uh, around uh, more staff for CBE client, compliance, excuse me, uh, at uh, DSLBD. And the uh, team is ensuring that uh, all current and future CBEs are compliant uh, with requirements now in place. In addition, uh, DSLBD is working with the Business Regulatory Reform Task Force that is being chaired uh, jointly by uh, Nick Majette. Yeah, David, yeah, okay. Uh, the, the two of them are, uh, David Goldblatt and, and Nick, are working on that task force. They've already put together, I think, the first interim report, and uh, there's a lot of work to be done there. That'll be an ongoing uh, process. Um, in any event, um, the council is back uh, this week uh, as of yesterday. Uh, they had a very active uh, agenda uh, yesterday that went on for a number of uh, hours, uh, a lot of uh, activity. Uh, and I think, again, not to be redundant, but to be a, a bit redundant, I think you'll find a lot more common ground uh, in the uh, agenda that they are pursuing and the one that we will, uh, that we are pursuing, the things that we've laid out here today. <clears throat> we'll have more detail uh, on those bills uh, that will be transmitted. I guess they will be transmitted. When, Janine? Okay. They will be transmitted yesterday. <laughs> they were. They were. <laughs> uh, but they were all ready to go. Uh, everybody's worked hard on that, and uh, we will be pursuing that package. Again, the minimum wage uh, legislation, we didn't transmit anything yesterday because we haven't crafted that bill uh, as yet. The intent is to talk to lots of people in the course of it. But the bill around tax lien sales, uh, our CFO nominee has obviously not been uh, transmitted yet. That will be announced before we transmit anything. Campaign finance, undergrounding the soccer stadium, sustainable DC Act 2013, the ban on coal, and CBE uh, reform. So let's take questions on that. And by the way, when we get, we get to the end, uh, there's an announcement I want to make. Uh, around uh, the events of the uh, of Monday, uh, around a couple of funds that will be set up in concert uh, with the uh, Community Foundation. Maybe Terry Freeman will be here by that time. Mark, uh, Mr. Mayor, I listened, I listened uh, attentively to the nine issues you mentioned. I'm really pleased that you did that. Uh, but you missed one um, that I don't understand. There is a bill, you and Congresswoman Norton, everybody espouses your advocacy for statehood. There is a bill, a statehood bill, which Senator Carper of Delaware has introduced. Um, and it actually goes to his committee. Uh, so you would think he would champion that bill. Uh, at the Frederick Douglass statue unveiling, in an unprecedented fashion, you were there. Harry Reid, the majority leader, said he has signed on to the bill. Can, can, I, can I stop you before you go further? The bills that I was talking about today were bills that we crafted and that are introdu introduced into our um, state legislative body. I understand yeah. the distinction. But my what, in our state legislative body? Yeah. yeah. My, my question is, what are your plans to talk to Senator Carver to hold a hearing on the bill? You know, 20 years ago, Senator Glenn held an informational hearing bill was never reported out. Now you have somebody, unlike Senator Black, who's in favor of the bill. In fact, he introduced it. I spoke to their office yesterday, and now they're sort of backing away. They're saying, we hope to have a bill. Or before he said, I know you and Congresswoman Norton went to see Harper in January. Mm -hmm. and he didn't bring up the subject. The point of it is, Senator Reed, by his statement, that he has signed on the bill, we'll probably have a floor vote on that. <coughs> I'm aware of the House is Republican. You're not going to bring it up. But what is the energy of this administration toward this bill? Uh, well, I think you know what my energy is. I hope you do anyway. Uh, my energy has been um, unbridled 
uh, from day one, uh, even as a council member, this is something that I worked very hard on, will continue to work hard on, recognizing that we know this is not going to change overnight. Uh, we'll continue to work quite vigorously but to try to, wait, see, wait, 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 wanna come up here? Uh, I, will do, I, I will do whatever I think will advance the cause of the District of Columbia, uh, Mark. And if that includes yet another meeting with Senator Carper, uh, I will do that. If it includes a meeting with Senator Reid, Majority Leader Reid, I will do that. And just so you know, um, we are, I think, I think I have a meeting today uh, on working on something that will involve developing a more enduring strategy for the city. One of my concerns has been that there have been a number of episodic uh, efforts, and one of those, of course, was the March on Washington, where we brought hundreds, thousands of people together at the War Memorial to focus on this issue. And a number of people said in the aftermath, okay, what's next, guys? And I don't know that, I mean, I could have told people what I think is next, but there was nothing I could say that reflects a concerted um, uh, strategy on the part of the city around what's next over the next 12, 24, 36 months. I think that needs to be developed, and that is exactly what we're going to be focusing on. And I think we have a meeting this afternoon uh, to be able to begin that discussion. And I, I, think, I think, Mark, that that's going to be essential to start to build the numbers. If you notice, by the way, at the March on Washington, some of the speakers there were people who had not really been, um, you know, their organizations had not been spokespersons uh, on this issue uh, very much in the past. So we're trying to build those ranks. And that's what we'll continue to do. Senator Pryor of Arkansas is the most endangered Democrat. He's on that committee. It's no good if the bill gets brought up, there's a hearing, and the bill isn't reported out favor. Do you have any plans to see Senator Pryor? I'll, I'll go back to what I said earlier, Mark, and that is I will see and engage with any and everybody who we think has a role, constructive role, to play uh, in moving this bill uh, forward. I, 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 again, I don't want to leave anybody with the impression that not being on this list in any way suggests that it is less uh, of a priority to us. I was focusing on those things that are part of our own legislative body here in the city. That's obviously on the Hill, and we will continue um, a vigorous effort with that, and that will include lots of different uh, strategies and approaches. And hopefully, as we work on a longer-term strategy, we'll include lots of other people. I think. I think one of the problems that we've suffered from, frankly, is not massive numbers of people knowing exactly what they should do. So they wait for others to do or tell or, you know, and then lots of times things just don't happen as a result of it. I hope you will participate uh, in the crafting of a strategy in your own way. Uh, he, he, uh, I'm, I'm, should I shut him down, Tom? <laughs> well, what do you, what do you think? Don't want to ask for equal time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll give you the, in equal time, we'll give you the next 25 minutes then. I'll just take a moment to answer your question. Now, on campaign finance reform, you are proposing reforms, but you've never given your explanation of what happened in 2010 with the laws that they existed then. Someone asked me this morning, how can the public trust you with new reform or even a second campaign Without clearing up 2010. Well, I think, you know, if you're asking me to start explaining the continuing investigation, you know I'm not going to do that. Uh, someone asked you that. That wasn't your idea. I might have been looking in the mirror. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to discuss that. It, it, it is an ongoing investigation. It's a, yeah, but it's, an, it's a piece of legislation that will be before the council. I've actually talked to people who are advocates on campaign finance reform who have lauded this piece of legislation. And frankly, like any piece of legislation, if somebody think it can, think, thinks it can be improved, I welcome that. They can put it on the table. They can amend it. We've had discussions. We've had hearings. It's time to move forward. Will this be effective for the 2010? I don't know. That, that, that ultimately will be up to the legislative body. It's getting kind of late in the day now uh, to be effective for 2010 since a lot of money has already been raised under existing campaign finance rules. So. I proposed this months and months ago, Tom, and you know that. Over a year, over a year ago. Pardon? Over a year ago. 
So it's not my fault that this didn't move. You need to go upstairs to about four, four more floors and uh, ask the question of why this hasn't moved. If it would have been left to me, it would have been moved months and months ago. Your campaign season officially starts November the 8th. <coughs> Pardon? Your campaign season starting November 8th with the picking up a petition mm. for the next mayor's term. You know that's a national holiday, right? It's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you promise to come and give. <laughs> other other questions, uh, Mike. <laughs> I did answer. <laughs> Mike. Mr. you mentioned the search for the new CFO. Can you tell me about the existing CFO? Is he on the job? Is he engaging in his job? Is there someone at the tiller of that office? After the post ran its series last week, we've not heard from Dr. Gandhi. Uh, I've seen, seen his name in a press release. We've heard from the spokesman. We've heard from Steve Porty of the tax office, who has done an interesting job of defending the, the office's activities in this situation. But where is Dr. Gandhi? Is he on the job? Is he doing his job? Is there someone running that department? Uh, my short answer would be yes. Uh, we certainly interacted with and engaged with Dr. Gandhi uh, during this process. Uh, we met with him. We talked with him. Uh, there were, you know, uh, Deputy Mayor Otero, uh, Attorney General Nathan, uh, had meetings with him along with uh, our, our budget uh, director, Eric Goulet. So I guess the short answer uh, is yes. Um, you know, we're all grateful that Dr. Gandhi agreed to, <coughs> excuse me, stay on past the point when he expected to have left because the search process was, uh, I won't say protracted, but was thorough uh, and painstaking. So um, yes, he is still on the job. Uh, some of you will recall he sent us a letter saying that he was willing to stay uh, until the new person had been uh, appointed. So yes. Did you or anyone else have a conversation with him saying, you know, this is blowing up in your face and it's reflecting poorly on your, your department in your city? job of responding? No, I didn't exactly say that, Mike, and I'm sure you probably uh, realize that. Uh, we, we certainly realized, uh, and I, I indicated to that, that this was something, this was an issue we needed to work uh, more closely on, and as a new CFO comes on, uh, one of the things that I hope we will do is flesh out areas that, um, you know, are the province of the CFO but have to involve the executive and the council uh, as well. And this was one of those issues. And, you know, quite frankly, I didn't know even about the uh, story that was coming until the day the first installment uh, was published. Uh, our director of communications, uh, Pedro uh, Ribeiro, I think he was told a story was coming on the Friday uh, before it was published, but I think it's correct to say, Pedro, you didn't even know what the substance was. Is that right? So obviously, um, even though we have an independent CFO, there's got to be uh, collaboration on issues uh, like this, and we will work to make sure that happens. Uh, last uh, just speaking about the search, can you just say what, what has been important to you in the process of conducting the search that you're looking for in the next CFO? Well, I think somebody who's got a track record, someone who has a proven track record of having managed these kind of complex, uh, you know, uh, financial uh, issues, uh, someone who has a uh, reputation with uh, elected leaders, with uh, appointed leaders for having done a good job, uh, somebody who certainly understands uh, what it means to work with the, uh, the rating agencies. Um, that would include Moody, Fitch, and standing in pores. Anybody remember that question he asked? Uh, excuse me? He asked it. I heard him on the air when he asked it. Didn't you do that? Yes. Yes, he did. He said he did. <laughs> he didn't do it? I see. So you all will remember the question that was asked about that uh, between Plotkin and Sherwood uh, some time ago. In, in any event, uh, somebody who has that uh, experience. Uh, someone, frankly, who has the experience also of managing lots of employees. There, there is no system like the one in the District of Columbia. There is no state or, or local jurisdiction that you can go to 
uh, in which the uh, chief financial officer uh, operation is essentially independent of the executive uh, and, the, uh, and the legislative body. And we have, because we have OTR that is subsumed on it, we have, I don't know, we have a total of 11 or 1,200 employees who work in the, in the, the CFO uh, operation, the Office of Chief Financial Op uh, I didn't say we'd have a less independent CFO. I talked about collaboration. Uh, we we haven't we haven't we have no bills that would advance uh, changing the CFO structure at this point. Sam. Now, now that's that's different than our legislative agenda. We, you want to hold that till we get to the general questions, if you don't mind, Sam. I'd appreciate that. Uh, in terms of what? On my list? Yeah, I, I, I was I was frankly focusing on those campaign issues, the campaign issues that I uh, that I listed a second ago. Oh, absolutely not. And I know you wouldn't let me leave either. <laughs> well, um, I guess it's imminent. Uh, I mean, whatever imminent means in this instance. But do we do we know? Do we have a date? Obviously, we have a tight time frame that we're operating within. We want to have all the land uh, issues settled by the first of January. So, I mean, we're obviously, you know, just about three and a half months away from that uh, at this stage. So, ASAP. It means ASAP. Um, in terms of what the swaps themselves, well, I know that the the conversations have continued uh, with uh, with uh, Ackridge. Is that right? And there are others that are ongoing, and I, I, you know, I think it could really contaminate those discussions if we get out there prematurely. Have you met with the junkyard? Um, I haven't met with the, I haven't met with the junkyard owner, the scrapyard owner, excuse me. Um, I haven't met with them personally, but I think there already had been interactions with somebody associated with that. I think that the discussion that went on uh, previously with someone who said there had been none, he wasn't really uh, privy. To what ha had been going on, so I think there've been discussions in one way or the other with everybody who's connected with an ownership role of this. Is, this, is that right, Alan? Okay. Bruce. Mayor, the council members who had supported that living wage bill will argue that they went after Walmart and those big box, uh, you know, companies because that's where the money is. What is your response to uh, in supporting that across the board? I think that's what the discussion, <coughs> excuse me, the discussion will be about, Bruce, and that is rather than do something precipitous and just introduce a piece of legislation and then it gets reacted to poorly by some, I want to do what I often do, and that is have the conversation by the stakeholders. That would include small businesses as well to hear from them. We know that, uh, I, I read, I haven't talked to her about this, but I know that Barbara, Cham uh, Barbara uh, uh, Lang of the Chamber was quoted as saying that she supports a, uh, you know, a, uh, an increase in the minimum wage as well. But I want to hear from her and I want to hear from those that uh, you know, she represents uh, about under what conditions do they support that. I'd like to have a bill, frankly, that goes forward that we can say right from the very outset represents the views of the people uh, here in the city. That's what we did on CBE reform, that by the time we got to that point, I don't know, how many hours of meetings did we have, Janine? Yeah. Are you saying that the Chamber of Commerce is basically going to take 50% Now, do you think I'm saying that? That's what it sounds like. That is not what I'm saying, Mike. And you know I'm not saying that. I just said stakeholders. That would be people who, who represent, in one or another way, the interest of how people are paid in the District of Columbia. It was an illustration uh, of someone who is very instrumental in uh, that part of the economy of the District of Columbia. No, I mean, there are many, many other people. There's the Board of Trade. There's DCBIA. There are worker advocates uh, in the District of Columbia uh, who we want to consult with. But you are for an increase in the D.C. minimum. Yeah, I've, I've indicated that. 
You did. You did. You you read. You read my veto letter, didn't you? Just a matter of how. Did you read my veto letter? Why did you not read that? Do you? Do you realize what an incredibly profound piece of work that was? Four full pages. Thank you. That's on the record. You did read it. What did you think of it? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some tips on the, you know, style and composition later. <laughs> so you thought it was a less than worthy product? <laughs> I have nothing to do with you all cast this as a Walmart bill because as you all cast these these issues in a way that grabs the sentiment of the public, you put them in those kind of terms. I said all along that this was a bill that involved many other people other than Walmart. Didn't I say that? Didn't I say that? That's right. And I hope you all will get that right the next time. Stakeholders, I mentioned the Board of Trade and the Chamber of Commerce. A couple of the bills that were introduced yesterday, they had specific targets in terms of what the minimum wage should be raised to and over how much how much time. Do you have any specifics in mind? Do you have a target wage or an ideal timeline of how that would be rolled out? Or are you just saying generically? No, I don't, I, I, that's why I want to have the discussion. Uh, but, but at the end of that discussion process, we'll certainly have some ideas on what we think it should go to because you can't raise the minimum wage without raising the minimum wage. That would be a truism. Um, and then there are things like indexing. <clears throat> you know, does someone want to do indexing? If you do indexing, um, do you have the wage go over a period of time to a certain level and then it's indexed after that? There are any number of questions that are associated with this that I want to tackle so that we have answers to that in the bill that's crafted and goes forward. Yes. I would ask the Congress to do what we always ask them to do. Let, let, let our local legislation be, in fact, what it is, local legislation. Uh, the Congress hasn't intervened recently that I know of with any legislation. I hope it stays that way. And I think whatever decisions are made are, should be the decisions of the people of the District of Columbia. That's why, we have, <clears throat> that's why we have a legislative body. That's why we have an incredibly effective mayor uh, who's involved <laughs> in these issues. <laughs> Wait a minute, let me make it. With any other hands, uh, okay. A brief question. On campaign finance, I haven't read uh, the bill that you proposed, uh, but does it include banning uh, two things corporate contributions, which are banned in federal elections, and second, uh, more importantly, which is really a giant uh, loophole, limited liability corporations, where a business can have 10 other businesses and contribute through that uh, mechanism where they were actually set up uh, literally just to be campaign contribution dispensers. Uh, if it doesn't have a ban on limited liability corporations, why doesn't it? Uh, let me ask Ariel. Uh, Ariel is representing the Attorney General today who is uh, ill. Uh, otherwise, Irv would be here and would speak uh, quite effectively for uh, himself. Ariel. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Ariel Levinson Waldman with the Office of the Attorney General. On your first question, the bill does not ban corporate contributions because after a great deal of study, what we've concluded is that that would be too broad. There are some corporations who are not the source of the problem here, and we don't want to stop, for example, small, small businesses from participating in the district's political system. On the second question, LLCs, the bill addresses the, that, that not by saying LLCs cannot participate, but instead by using strong aggregation rules that say anybody, person, corporation, business, LLC, LLP, name your corporate entity. Anybody who is affiliated with another entity will be counted together for purposes of the aggregation rules so that you can't evade. And that's really been the problem in the past is, as you said, Mark, 10 different LLCs all associated with the same person. Formally, they're separate. They give separate money and they evade the rules. If the mayor's bill is accepted on this point, on this aggregation rule point, that will not be 
permitted anymore by LLCs or by any other business or person. Is that annual aggregation to all candidates or to just one particular candidate? How do you compose the aggregation? The aggregation is to a particular candidate from a particular person as aggregated with all that person's affiliated businesses. And there's no change in the limits or the taxes? Not in this bill, no. All right, anything else on the legislative agenda? All right, we will be uh, pursuing that <coughs> quite aggressively. Uh, Janine Jackson, who has led our efforts in uh, the Office of uh, Policy and Legislative Affairs uh, since I got here, uh, will continue to do that, of course, and I think she's done a great job. Uh, and I, I'm, I don't think I'm alone uh, in those sentiments either. So thank you, Janine. And all of that is to say, every one of those bills, get, bills better get passed. Your name. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, before we move on to just the general uh, issues, I'm going to ask uh, Terry Freeman if she would come up. The Community Foundation has um, an announcement it wants to make around uh, a relief fund and a, uh, a I guess, safe communities uh, fund. Terry, as you know. Uh, is working with us on the uh, city fund uh, as well that um, hopefully will be in place before too long. And you, th you think about this. If we had the authority to approve our own budget, um, we would have no issue about on October 1st, all of that money would be available to us. But because we are treated like a federal agency, um, our budget is never, there's never certainty around whether we can spend our own money raised from our tax dollars, our property taxes, our income taxes, our sales taxes in the District of Columbia, from the 632,000 people who live in the District of Columbia. But because we are shackled with those absolutely awful, you know, strictures, unlike anybody else in America, we don't know when we'll be able to start to spend our money. Did I say that right? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Terry. Good morning. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for allowing me this time just uh, to make an announcement. The Community Foundation for the National Capital Region is a public charity, public foundation with the mission to encourage and promote effective giving and to take leadership on critical issues in our community. Um, we are opening two funds uh, effective today. Uh, uh, the first is the Navy Yard Relief Fund, which will be open to accept contributions from individuals, organizations, in support of the victims, families, and the injured from Monday's terrible, terrible event. The fund is to support the needs of those families. 100% of the contributions will be distributed to the families and the contributions into the fund are tax deductible. Um, we wanted to make sure that we responded in some way because we feel it really is the responsibility of the Community Foundation to serve this community. And sadly, we've had this uh, experience before when we had to open the Survivors Fund after the September 11th event. But we also wanted to do something that focused on a longer term solution. Um, I think I, like many, were very moved by Dr. Olowski's comments that were kind of off the cuff. And as I watched her, and frankly, as I heard the president and seeing him up there yet again talking about tragic gun violence, um, I thought, you know, we've just got to do something because it's not just these mass events, but it's the violence that occurs in our communities on a daily basis. And I'm not just talking about the district. I'm talking about Prince George's County, Montgomery County, Northern Virginia. So we are also opening the Safer Communities Fund. And the Safer Communities Fund is really going to address the long-term systemic challenge of violence in the region. As a community foundation uh, and as residents of the region, we really do believe it's our duty to do all we can to help make our community a more healthy, safe, and stable place to live. Thus, the Safer Communities Fund will support nonprofit organizations 
that specifically offer mental health services, mental health awareness, and a focus on reducing gun violence in our community. Um, both of those funds we will have, we actually have a press release uh, with us today, but the funds will be open. Um, individuals can make contributions to either or both of the funds. The two are not connected, so I don't want anyone to think that they are connected. The former, the Navy Yard Relief Fund, is specifically for the families and the injured. And the Safer Communities Fund, frankly, is for the broader community. We believe that's our role in this community. We've been around for 40 years, and we will continue to be uh, as good of a citizen to the metropolitan Washington region as we possibly can be. And I appreciate the mayor allowing me to make this announcement this morning. You know, since Mark brought up the issue of legislation at the, uh, at the national, the federal level, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we had sensible gun control uh, legislation uh, in America? I mean, how, how, how in the world can we not have background checks uh, on people? And there's certainly elements associated with this incident on Monday that would raise questions about why it is that we don't have you know, background checks uh, done uh, on people as they purchase guns. You, you go and look at the, the, the circumstances associated with this. This gun, this shotgun was bought, you know, in Lorton, uh, Virginia. You know, and we can have whatever gun control uh, laws that we want in the District of Columbia, and then we're completely vulnerable to surrounding jurisdictions whose laws may be much more lax uh, than ours. So, you know, I hope that I'm not just talking to that wall over there, because the day will come, hopefully, when we do have uh, federal legislation that will address some of these issues. I thought it would have come in the, uh, in the wake of Newtown, you know, Sandy Hook, and it didn't. Uh, will it come in the wake of this incident? I don't know. I hope that the District of Columbia and the Navy Yard will be used as illustrations of why this needs to be done. Uh, and frankly, um, the conversation needs to be continued, Mark, just like it needs to be continued around uh, autonomy and freedom uh, and liberty. Uh, for the people uh, of the District uh, of Columbia. So, again, Terry, thank you very much for that. Hey, can we follow that up with a question? Yes. Can you also address security on these uh, military bases? Uh, I mean, you have others right here in the city. What, what is your concern about how this, this, this man who had come to the attention of people in the past was able to smuggle, if that's the correct word, uh, uh, this kind of weapon onto a military base? Well, I, I, I applaud the uh, Secretary of Defense and his commitment to have a, uh, a deep and sweeping review of uh, security procedures at all of our military installa installations, especially uh, in our federal uh, buildings. But it almost goes deeper than that uh, to me, Bruce. Why did the man have credentials that permitted him to be on the base in the first place? This is somebody who should have been foreclosed uh, from that opportunity, given the history that we have now found out in the aftermath. So. You know, we can't, obviously, there's nothing we can do about the 12 people uh, and their families who were deeply affected uh, by this, but we certainly can do something about the future. And I hope that having these kinds of procedures in place, having a review of the security uh, measures that are in place, and make changes, not just have a study, but take whatever we find from this and really implement the changes that need to be made. And, you know, for my part, anyway, you know, I was, I was out there all day uh, on Monday involved in this, uh, you know, as, as deeply as one can be involved in it. And uh, we learned a lot about the people uh, that were involved in this. We learned a lot of, over the last couple of days about Mr. Alexis, uh, you know, and a lot, of a lot of questions that were raised. So I hope we will use this as, a, as an instructive moment understand what we didn't do that we should have done or what did the country didn't do and make those changes. Emphasizing security Well, we always do. Uh, we always do. Uh, we are very careful. Uh, I guess, Brian, that would be an area of endeavor for you. I don't, I'm not going to ask you to come up here and detail the procedures that we have in place for security, but I happen to know, you know, through our own internal uh, enforcement folks uh, in, in the Protective Services uh, Agency 
and then those contractors that there's constant uh, effort to be able to try to ensure that they do as effective a job as they possibly can. Um, so, you know, we'll be happy to talk to people at the federal level if they would like to know uh, what we do here in the District of Columbia around these kinds of issues. Sam? Well, I can't answer that, obviously, Sam, because I don't know that there is an answer uh, at this stage. Um, I, I actually coincidentally had a meeting uh, right here in this building last Friday with the Commandant of the Navy Yard, uh, Mark Rich, uh, who, uh, and we talked about the fact that, uh, to both of our knowledge, um, the Navy Yard has been a very secure uh, place. Uh, but there certainly are some procedures that could be, that need to be looked at and, and changed, and that, is, again, um, what good does it do to have, you know, strong security measures if you have credentials issued to people who shouldn't have credentials uh, in the first place? You're right. I mean, I, I've seen both ends, ends of the spectrum. I've seen the Navy Yard where, you know, in, within reasonable terms, you can get into the Navy Yard, get into the Conference and Catering Center for events that are held there. And then um, bowling for many years, it was virtually impossible, no matter what your role was in the city, uh, to be able to get onto the uh, grounds of bowling. There seems to be some mitigation uh, of that at bowling. Uh, but again, this is an opportunity, it should be an ongoing process uh, to look at the security measures that are in place. How are credentials issued to people, be they contractors, be they employees, uh, be they visitors? Uh, all of that needs to be looked at. And I applaud uh, Secretary Hagel for taking this on, and hopefully this will move expeditiously. Are you worried at all that the Navy Yard will close down again? I worry less about that, Tom, and more about the safety and security uh, of the people uh, who work uh, there and the people who uh, go there for whatever purposes uh, they may have. That's where it starts. Matt? Yeah, well, we hope they don't become enclaves. Uh, we hope that the people that work there have a relationship uh, with, interaction with the surrounding communi communities, because I think that would be the most natural experience for us. But I really think, uh, short of them becoming enclaves, there are ways in which we can ensure that we know who's on these uh, installations in the first place, who's on those grounds. Um, this had nothing to do, and I won't say nothing, but it certainly uh, was influenced by how this gentleman became part of a contractor community that was allowed to be there and how he was issued uh, <coughs> credentials uh, in the first place to be on the grounds. If we start to look at that, you may come to a conclusion that this is a person that wouldn't have even gotten there in the first place uh, had there, there been stricter measures uh, in place. So I think that's where we need to start, uh, and then we go from there. That's a good place to end. Thank you all very much. Oh. What, what? Well, what I was saying is yesterday another big issue that the council dealt with was Council Member Marion Barry. He was censured. I guess this is the, I understand the second time in three years, the first time when you were, were head of the council. What, what are your thoughts? Well, that is a council issue. Um, I did not get involved in it, uh, you know, purposely. Uh, that was something that they had to decide. Uh, I, I did not get involved in it, Sam. I'm not sure even what you're asking me. They took action yesterday. I guess it was a nine to a nine to four vote. Um, so, you know, whatever 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 action they took, um, we will of course respect that, and we will continue to work with the council uh, in attempting to move the city forward. Thank you all very much.